very good afternoon to all of you. And a shout out to our panelists here. Uh, we've graciously uh, accepted our invitation to be here in a hot seat. Uh, many years ago, when I was a much younger man, you know, I was about to turn uh, 18, I remember that uh, a lot of my friends where their families owned car, they were starting to go for driving license, uh, lessons, so pre preparing to get their driving license. So it was always an aspiration of mine, uh, coming from a family that didn't own a car, uh, to want to own a car at some point of time. You know, I want to work hard, earn money, and I want to own a car in the future. Uh, yet today, you know, if you look at many reports, uh, you see that uh, youngsters don't, they don't even want to get a driving license. So something has changed you know, in the way in which we think about car ownership. Uh, here today in the panel, I've assembled people who are working on technology uh, that would perhaps make car ownership even less necessary in the future. Right? And I'll get them to share a little bit more. But you know, in this shift, we've also seen how car makers are shifting their strategies, they're shifting about the way they think about their business for the future. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. Arthur, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Arthur is the CEO of GoBell Group. Uh, GoBell is the largest uh, leasing company for industrial and commercial vehicles in Singapore. Well, I'll say that that's a fairly traditional uh, business you know, uh, for transportation. Uh, but you've also started SWAT. Uh, which is uh, doing dynamic uh, rousing algorithm. Can you maybe share with us what were your observations in the past and why are you getting into SWOT? So, so let's talk about the short term, then the long term of what I view in mobility. Um, in the short term, from 2017 to 2018, the compounded annual growth rate of manufacturers was minus 6%. So I do see a decline uh, in the manufacturer industry for vehicles. Uh, another trend that I'm seeing is the Chinese are getting stronger and stronger. And this is propped out by two reasons. The first reason is that for the first time, the Chinese have a window of opportunity to compete with the Europeans and the Americans because of electric. For many years, they have been behind in the uh, internal combustion engine space and now it's a chance for the Chinese to compete. So they're spending lots of money. And traditionally, the manufacturing market that's dominated by the US and the European companies are finding it tougher and tougher because the Chinese are producing cheaper and more effective vehicles. So this is the trend that I'm seeing. Uh, this is the short-term trend that I'm seeing. In the medium to long-term trend, what I did notice is due to electric vehicles, the number of components that will be produced for electric vehicles are much lesser than internal combustion engine vehicles. As a result of that, the value chain of the manufacturing industry for vehicles will reduce. This gives more pressure to manufacturers, and the manufacturers will likely pass on the pressure to the dealers, which is the leasing market I'm in. So another trend that I also noticed was the car light industry. Uh, with car light, I think manufacturers will start to think whether they want to produce vehicles, whether the business model is to produce more and more vehicles to sell, or is it to get into the service itself? So if manufacturers are going to the service itself, and I'm a distributor selling and leasing a different brands of vehicles, I better start to rethink my strategy. That's why I got into SWAT. Oh, that's very interesting. So technology advancement, that's changing the, vet, uh, the supply chain for you, and then that's pushing down the pressure towards uh, companies like yourself. So therefore, you yeah. saw the need to get into new business. I, I forgot to add something. Sorry, I assumed that because I use SWAT so, so frequently, I assumed that everyone knew what SWAT was doing. So uh, just give me a, a minute to explain what SWAT does. A couple of, around three years ago, I had, the, I had an idea, right? So we created an algorithm that was able to move objects that were sporadic in demand in the shortest time possible with the least number of assets. So this algorithm was built, and we tested it on global benchmarks. There were dynamic routing benchmarks. And we found out that we came in globally number one in the most complex categories for moving things. Then we started to think, what do we want to move? And the most sexy market back then was, uh, three years ago, was the com commuting market. So we started with this, and we had the vision to do high-capacity pooling, uh, creating a value proposition for consumers, speed like a taxi, price like a bus. So this is what SWAT does. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm going to jump over to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, you're the country director and the CEO of Thales in Singapore here. Or well, Thales, as we all know, a uh, well-known MNC. Uh, well, I'll consider you more like an industrial uh, engineering uh, conglomerate. Right? Uh, some of your businesses uh, include aerospace. You're also in real transportation, security. A little bit also on the traditional side of things, I'll say. Right? So what's happening in your business? Um, thanks, Louis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, our business is, is rapidly changing, and, and I think if you look at the mega trend um, uh, that uh, you guys are all familiar with, it's really um, one of the mega trends driving our business is urbanization. Um, I was surprised to check the latest figure this morning. Um, uh, the world population, 7.6 billion. Uh, off, kind of off the top of my head, that was not the number I had in mind, but if you look at it, um, more than, what, 50% of, of this uh, 7.6 billion uh, people worldwide uh, live in cities. And um, Thales is in the business of mission-critical systems. So i just give you two examples and two buckets where um, we see uh, how, uh, I guess, what you call a traditional business like us is being uh, shaken up. So the first bucket is in the aviation value chain. Mm -hmm. So if you look at aviation, Thales is present in the aircraft, um, so we have uh, electronics in the cockpit, we have electronics in the cabin that uh, some passengers play with, mm -hmm. and uh, we have also a presence in the air traffic management space. So for example, when you guys fly out from Singapore, the air traffic management system that um, air traffic controllers at CAS use is from us. Mm -hmm. We also have a presence at, at airports. Now that whole aviation uh, value chain is being uh, shaken up by unmanned. If you look at it, um, how many, how many aircraft, civil airliners, do you think there are in the world today? I mean, depending on the reports, but let's take order of magnitude. 20,000 civil airliners. Those are the airplanes that transport all of us when we go on holiday and on business. But you think about the number of, let's say, potential drones out there that you have to control. The numbers we're talking about is millions, tens of millions, maybe 100 million. Um, today, you can have um, air traffic controllers controlling planes, I guess, using our systems, command and control systems. But um, in the future, with uh, drones, um, things are going to get disrupted. So one example is how we are kind of getting into new space, new waters, is, um, is the uh, collaboration that we've done with uh, Bell Helicopters. So uh, recently at CES uh, Las Vegas, mm. uh, Bell announced a, a collaboration with us on what they call Bell Nexus, which is basically a flying unmanned Taxi. So, uh, you know, Arthur is doing a, a dynamic uh, routing. You can imagine the potential today um, of uh, urban air mobility transforming how we, we do things. So, Thales has already got into this because we bring our expertise on flight control, we bring our expertise on air traffic management, and we bring our expertise on, on command and control, C2 type of uh, software. So, you see, that's the first bucket we're being disrupted. The second bucket, if you, if you look at, uh, by the way, uh, your dream of owning a car, um, <laughs> being quite good friends with uh, LTA, we would advise you, of course, to, uh, to take the MRT as well. <laughs> okay. If you look at it, if you look at it, um, uh, today in large cities like, uh, like, like Singapore, I mean, of course, I think aspiration of everyone is to have a very convenient personal mode of uh, transportation. But if you really want to move a huge number of people fast, uh, safely, efficiently, it's, it's the train, right? We're talking about, uh, and that's one of the, the key businesses of, of Thales. Now, interestingly, um, our, in our traditional business, all the cities want, uh, let's say, more throughput. So we come in and we say, okay, we can strip out your old system and we can give you a new system and your, your throughput goes up. Now, what, what, we, uh, what we are facing right now as a, as a trend uh, shaking us up is that um, uh, today what people want is more connected and uh, more digital. So in the past, all of these uh, systems were fairly stovepipe. So you, you only have visibility at, at sliver of, uh, of, of uh, the data. Today, if you look at it, um, uh, a lot of players are coming in uh, and they want visibility throughout their system. You want to be able to fuse data, make sense of it. So even in that um, area, we are seeing um, uh, big, uh, big changes. Mm. It's very interesting. I, I want to pick up on the point that you mentioned about you know, uh, flying autonomously over the air. And it seems like autonomy is one of those big trends uh, that we're seeing in the world of mobility. 
And here, you know, maybe Doug, you could share with us some of your insights here. Uh, you're the COO for Newtonomy. Uh, Newtonomy has been developing autonomous vehicles here in Singapore about four years now, testing them as well. Uh, I think you've significantly expanded your team here. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how autonomy is going to disrupt uh, the world of mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll introduce myself real quick. Doug Parker with the uh, COO of Newtonomy and uh, Aptiv Autonomous Mobility. So uh, Aptiv is a tier one automotive company that's been building the connected electric and green car components and, and now systems for the future of, of cars as they are developing. Um, recently, they've made a big push, including acquiring Newtonomy, into autonomous vehicles, because this is really the, the, one of the big mega trends. Why did Aptiv do that? So uh, a number of reasons. I think, you know, all the trends that we've been talking about, uh, moving away from car ownership, I remember uh, walking around Singapore a few years ago thinking, when I make it, you know, uh, I'm going to take the, the premium service from Grab. It wasn't, I'm going to buy the, uh, the, the X5 or, or something like that. It was really, and I, I had that moment, I thought, wow, you know, my dream now is to take the premium service, not to, to, to own. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, I, and I'm old, you know, it, it's uh, the people in my company, we have 150 people now in Newtonomy, uh, Aptiv in, in Singapore, and uh, we have seven parking spaces, thanks to uh, good land planning from the LTA. So how do you park? Uh, it turns out we don't have demand for those seven parking spaces. We have two or three people that drive, and the rest uh, you know, take MRT or, or take their bicycles or other, come by other ways, which is pretty incredible that, that that future trend, moving away from car ownership, is really not a future trend, it's today. And so it, autonomous is the piece that makes that really work. It takes the cost down 50%. It takes safety up uh, orders of magnitude. <clears throat> I was surprised to learn that uh, roughly 1.4 million people die every year in automobile accidents around the world. That's like a 737 crashing every hour. And now if, if that was aviation, we would never allow that, mm -hmm. uh, that type of, of uh, danger. Uh, autonomous vehicles gives us a way to take automobiles from users and put them into more of a a setting where we can really achieve aviation-like safety. So I'm excited about that. I'm also very excited, you know, as much as I, as Grab and Uber and, and others have taken up the quality, the, the experience of riding in a shared car, Autonomous will take it up even further. It's going to be more comfortable. It's going to be more smooth. It's going to be more reliable and predictable. You know, there's still, whether you call it 5% or so of drivers, you really don't want to see again in, uh, when you get into a shared car. This will be the same driving experience each time. So this increase in safety, increase in experience, decrease in cost is really going to create a lot of opportunities for, for Singapore and other cities around the world. I think we've touched on many good points here. So basically, cities, cities are getting crowded. We need more throughput to the, through the city. And many of these technologies that we're working on are going to help us achieve that throughput. And you know, Saurav, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, you are the founder as well as the CEO of Quantum Inventions. Uh, and, you know, on your corporate profile, it says that you work on mobility intelligence. I, I want you to help us break it down a little bit. What does mo mobility intelligence mean? Before that, I want to say that I share the same passion with you about owning cars. Do you own one? <laughs> uh, I won't answer that. <laughs> <but> <laughs> uh, and uh, it was back in 1996 that I accepted a scholarship to come here and study in Singapore. And the only reason that was because it was a foreign country. I didn't know I landed in the wrong country for cars. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so uh, we have to go back a little bit to answer that question, perhaps, and how we evolved. Uh, so in the first part of my life, I worked as a researcher in NTU, straight out of university, published heavily, almost was on my way to a PhD. But I realized uh, I would like to commercialize technologies rather than actually just print the papers. Uh, no offense to any researchers in the crowd. Um, um, However, um, uh, there was, it was very difficult to license IPs at that point in time, uh, at least in my experience. So one thing led to another. I actually struck out and co-founded the company with a university academic as well. Um, and uh, our first uh, uh, business was with Ministry of Defense. Uh, it's often that we, uh, I mean, we don't really talk about that much, but our first licensing contract was the Ministry of Defense. And basically the technology that we got from the university or we bought from the university was in routing. Uh, 
routing is a very core part of any optimization, whether it's on the ground, 3D, or otherwise, uh, or like my co-panelist also mentioned, and in moving things around. So uh, we actually licensed our technology to MINDEF to optimize uh, movement on the ground, and that's where the mobility intelligence started, I would say. We, of course, moved very quickly to uh, creating navigation software in Southeast Asia, the first with traffic information services. Mm. We worked with interoperability a lot to bring that onto, onto the marketplace as well. And that led to our consumer business, I would say. One thing led to another, and uh, today we are a part of uh, the next generation road pricing project as well, working on the heavy data management part for traffic analytics, congestion, and so forth. So for us, mobility intelligence is all about optimizing the movement on the ground. And that's where it comes from. But uh, allow me to speak a bit further on the general uh, topic of the change. Um, I think the negative 6% is definitely a, a huge uh, early warning to tier ones as well as automotive makers. But essentially what we are moving towards is uh, services. And uh, the car is not going to go away tomorrow. We might be car light. We might be lesser cars on the road. Ownership might decline, and it should in many ways. Uh, but we want to still use the same services. Today, we still prefer hopping into a car, whether it's Grab or Uber in other countries, but we want a private transport almost. Um, but at the same time, it should move towards pooling, that being more economical as well as more effective on the green strategies for countries and cities. So the services will have to go up levels and levels. And that's where automotive companies and our parent company, Continental, also is looking at the innovation on the services side. So that's the big business model shift. And uh, if you look at it from a technology sector standpoint, uh, we have done it a long time back in moving towards the services uh, viewpoint rather than one-time sales and so on. Yeah. So you, that's you, the shift. You reminded me that Continental acquired uh, Quantum Inventions as well, right? So congratulations on an acquisition. And, uh, but you know, Continental, I think most of us would recognize it firstly as a tire company. Secondly, maybe for the people who are known, they would think of it as an automotive uh, tier one supplier, right? Uh, you know, what is happening at Continental? Why are they making this acquisition of a company that's into mobility intelligence? Because it made a lot of sense. But <laughs> 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 so uh, yes, apart from Continental Tires, I've also been asked if Continental is the uh, airlines company. Uh, so it, it really varies. Uh, but for us, it was a full circle, very frankly. Uh, a little known fact is that one of our first letters of intent for business was from Siemens Video, the predecessor in Singapore for yes. Continental. So for us, it was a full circle over 10 years, very frankly. And perhaps that played a bit of an emotional part when we chose who to acquire us. Um, now, Continental, as, as we all know, uh, as per your, uh, your guideline as well, it's a, uh, it's a tire company and it's an automotive TO1. Uh, and from that perspective, they come from the automotive side. Of course, facing a lot of the pressures that is quite common in, the, in that industry today. We came from an uh, intelligent transportation system side, uh, selling services into uh, consumer applications, into government systems and solutions. A lot of the government agencies in Singapore use our technology, as well as the private sector from the logistics side, mostly outside of Singapore in places like Indonesia and Malaysia, where there's a real logistics problem to solve. Um, and from um, that perspective, we come from the other side of the domain, which is from the government and private sector side, or what we would call the fleet side. And if you look at the, the stakeholdership on the ground, it's governments, it's fleets, it's, it's automobile makers. And uh, putting it very uh, simplistically. And from that perspective, we bring a different kind of capability as services for fleets and governments, which should eventually confluence with the automotive technologies of the future towards the one platform approach to be able to summon any vehicle, whether it's electric vehicle, whether it's an autonomous shuttle, or any other kinds of transport. So we saw that they, um, that they liked our approach in that direction, and I believe that's one of the reasons. You will, of course, have to ask Continental that question as well. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll ask uh, some of my contacts at Continental, of course. Uh, Kevin, would you like to make any comments uh, around that? I mean, your, your business had been around uh, engineering solutions. Right, and here, what we're hearing is uh, there seems to be also this slant now towards more pro of a provision of services type of model. Uh, any comments on that from Thales's point of view? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a very good question. Um, the Thales business model in mission critical systems in, in most of the stuff that we do, uh, of course, we, we also, I guess, uh, have a business model where we sell boxes, right? We, we do, um, for example, defense equipment, and, and some of that is, um, I guess you could call it, quote-unquote, selling boxes. 
Um, but typically, our business model is uh, system sales. So it's like a capex deal where, um, where government may put down some money for a certain system. Um, increasingly, uh, with digital transformation um, being more pervasive, um, we see a lot more appetite for, uh, for services. Because um, you know, just like how you guys um, may want to try out Netflix or Spotify, um, digital services for enterprises and for governments is a, is a bit like that. So um, we have um, uh, radically transformed also how we, we see the market. Uh, we have set up um, uh, what we call a digital factory. Well, three digital factories actually, the, the mothership being in, in, um, in France, in Paris. Mm -hmm. And then um, one uh, recently set up in November. Um, you were there to, to help us uh, launch it with Minister. Uh, Chan Chun Singh in, in November, and also one in Montreal. Um, these uh, digital factories um, are meant to develop software uh, that could potentially be sold as services. So what, what you're talking about, uh, services, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big thing for, for us. Um, uh, still in, in the government markets, um, you know, we deal with, let's say, um, land transport authorities worldwide. In those markets, um, uh, the procurement process is not fully um, mm. clarified, mm. but we see a definite trend towards um, more of these digital services, even for, I guess, a mission-critical system company like, like us. Mm. Uh, thanks for mentioning the digital factory. I was going to ask also, you know, given all these gro global trends, there are business opportunities that are supposed to be uh, captured, uh, but why, why Singapore in this case? So why did you open the digital factory in Singapore? Well, um, you know, when we look at um, the, you know, the trends uh, affecting our business and we try to translate that into, hey, what's the role of Singapore? Um, I see two buckets. One is, I think, the, quite easy to understand, the bucket of business. Um, all of us uh, living here in Singapore, uh, we, we do business in region. And um, why, why do we do that? I think it's quite clear. The talent, um, the fact that Singapore is connected, um, rules are clear. Um, we've got good uh, government support from, from people like you guys. We've got good uh, customers and partners here. So it makes sense to do business um, uh, from, uh, from Singapore for the region. Uh, one case in point that we, we've done, for example, talking about mobility, uh, we, we're actually executing three major projects for Taiwan in the area of mobility from, uh, from uh, Singapore. Uh, and that was a business we started, what, three years ago? So um, it's uh, fairly exciting in, uh, in that regard. The other one which is um, uh, more on the digital factory you're talking about is, is the whole space of innovation. Uh, we've had um, an innovation hub in Singapore doing design thinking with our customers since 2014. And I think yes. we, today design thinking is kind of everywhere, but um, we, um, we, have, we are very proud of uh, the work we've done with our customers in co-creating uh, ideas. Um, we have also have uh, joint labs with the universities, um, actually two joint labs with, uh, with NTU. Um, and, uh, you know, Digital Factory is the next chapter for us. We created it here because largely we see the, the talent. Uh, we see the, the fact that our customers in Singapore and our partners like LTA, SMRT, uh, they're very hungry for, um, uh, to try out new things. Uh, new ways of doing things, new technologies that can bring um, operational uh, benefits. So I'll give you one example. Um, with LTE and SMRT, we have, um, we have a simulation facility at Bishan Depot. And that is the largest, uh, probably the largest signaling simulation facility in the world. Uh, because we've compared it with what we, we had, and I think this is like three, four times uh, bigger. It can simulate anything, any changes we do to the system, uh, on a very large-scale basis. So you tweak something, you can see the effects before actually rolling it out um, in, in real time and in real life. Um, so we, we chose um, uh, Singapore for the digital factory because we can build applications uh, that, can, that can be tested. So these are some examples of, of um, why we're doing this. But one thing I want to say about talent, um, uh, we talked about being in Singapore for talent is that we are looking to, to um, Singapore and, and we are, of course, trying to recruit from this market, not only for digital talent, which is a whole new world for us, yep. but also we continue to, to need engineering uh, talent because where our systems meet real life, there must be some hardware somewhere, right? So we still continue to uh, need to employ uh, good people who understand uh, reliable hardware, 
how to deploy these systems uh, in real life. But at the same time, we need digital folks who are agile, right? Who are, we like to say, humble, hungry and aware. That's our mantra, right? Humble, hungry and aware. Um, and and uh, I think it's a whole new experience for us. And, and we realize that it's not only technical, but also cultural. So it's good to hear that you, know, you still have these need for very hard engineering skills to make uh, complex systems work. Uh, maybe I could turn to Doug at this point of time, right? Because uh, the systems you're developing are, are not uh, simple. No. And I suppose uh, it's not something you can do with rapid prototyping or I don't know what you call them. Uh, uh, but maybe there's some, some ground to think about you know, fast iterations and so on. C could you share a little bit about you know, w what are you doing here in Singapore and why is Singapore relevant to your, your business? Yeah, I, I think uh, why Singapore could be summarized by the, you know, the Singapore government very willing to take risk early on in this field. Uh, Emilio, you mentioned we've been here for four years. Actually, uh, Emilio Frazzoli, one of our founders, started about 10 years ago researching autonomous vehicles in Singapore mm -hmm. with, with money for, um, from the SMART initiative, the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. And with that, he was able to build a talent base of people that were working on this technology. And we've built around that kernel. So four years ago, we, we spun out from the university, uh, spun out from MIT in the US, and grew that team here. We're about half Singaporean, about half uh, foreign. But when I look at the number of countries, I stopped counting once we got to 40 countries. I mean, that's how diverse that's our talent is coming from. Belarus, Ukraine, Luxembourg, of course, all over the region, um, all over the world. So uh, being able to attract that talent here build on that kernel has allowed us to, to be testing. Um, and, and really, this has been one of our largest R&D centers as, as a company. The, you mentioned uh, not being able to do rapid prototyping. In fact, that's really what we are doing. Uh, okay. We use agile methods. We're out there every day testing new, new features, new software. And the fact that we can take it from, you know, from the computers to the cars, to the test track, to the road, uh, you know, in short order allows us to really keep pushing it forward. So it's, it's been very exciting to, to be able to make that happen in Singapore. Mm. But, but safety is a big concern, right, for, for autonomous vehicles. Yeah, Can safety you share is. a little bit about, you know, how do you marry this need for safety with rapid prototyping? Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, of course, safety is our, our biggest concern. Um, a few things. One is really implementing a safety culture. One of our core values is anyone can press the red button. And so really, if, if you see something that you don't think is safe or you think we shouldn't be doing, it's, it's not just your right, but it's your obligation to, to press that red button and say, guys, let's, let's stop and think about this. And so that's allowed us to have very, very safe operations over the, the millions of miles we've driven. Um, additionally, I think just good software practices, good development practices, <clears throat> every piece of code is peer reviewed. Every piece of code is tested in simulation extensively. It's tested on tracks extensively with all kinds of robotic pedestrians. I'm, I'm glad not to be the pedestrian anymore. It used to be I was the number one pedestrian that walked in front of the car, and then our head of reception was the number two pedestrian. And um, if we both trusted it, that was, not, now we have robotic pedestrians. That uh, luckily, I was never hit. The robotic pedestrians have never been hit. Um, it's, That's good to hear. Yeah, exactly. But we go through that safety step anyways, and then we take it out on public roads. Um, Again, it's about establishing good, safe processes. After we've driven 10 kilometers on new code on the public road, we stop. We go back to the office and say, OK, guys, is there anything we're seeing we don't like? Let's just pause and say, is there something that is concerning us? And um, you know, usually not. But if there is something, we'll go back and say, OK, well, let's, let's take that off the road and, and do more testing before we release it. So I think you know, A, having the right culture in place, B, having good processes in place has really allowed us to, to maintain a great safety record. Maybe I could ask the panelists as well. Have you found any uh, factors or elements within the Singapore environment that has made it easier for you to do some of these testing uh, before you consider export of your solution to the region? Uh, maybe Arthur, you could. I, I hear that you're thinking of the regional markets as you are uh, developing your algorithms for SWAT. So, so now we are in four countries and testing another four more, so eight countries in the pipeline. and. Uh, I'll answer this very authentically and maybe not so diplomatic, but it's a diplomatic <laughs> answer anyway. So uh, with, with Singapore, I, what I do notice is that um, Singapore has no resources. Everyone knows that. Right? So we have to be thought leaders. So the Singapore government knows that we have to be thought leaders. And to be thought leaders and to succeed, the Singapore government, from my observation, 
has the guts to test, to refine, and to execute. So this is the natural environment of Singapore, which um, I think I'm very lucky in, uh, to be in Singapore, to actually work with the authorities to test and to execute new technologies and, and, and launch them in new places. And uh, one other thing that I wanted to say is I happen to be very lucky to sit on the board in uh, uh, Land Transport Master Planning 2040. And before I explain about what this board does, I wanted to share a McKinsey article that I read about ASEAN smart cities. So the article spoke about what it takes to make or execute well or convert a city in ASEAN to be a smart city. One of the things that the article spoke a lot about is bottoms up approach and engaging the public. And if you notice the board in the Land Transport Master Planning, it's so inclusive, it includes um, LTA, URA, MOT, Ministry of Transport, includes NPARCs, includes a Red Cross, and it even engages the public whenever it comes up with a certain uh, strategy and decision. So because of that, whenever you work with the Singapore authorities, the whole uh, strategy becomes extremely holistic. And because the government is willing to test and, and I said, uh, keep refining and executing, it allows me to have a very good test bait, a very good branding when I start speaking to overseas uh, partners and it allows me to, to execute well overseas because the, the testing requirements in Singapore are so stringent. Thanks very much for that. Saraf, I, I, I remember you mentioned that it's not so easy to export uh, from Singapore. Do you want to share some insights there? Especially for an academic. So, uh, <laughs> at least one that was an academic. So, um, uh, thinking about the, the points that I was just listening to, uh, so I, here I was an academic, very idealistic uh, on licensing technology from the university. And my first step out was to say that, okay, I've got to uh, put my money where my mouth is and, and resign from the university and get out uh, into the industry. So that was a very difficult step back then, uh, stupid perhaps, but uh, here we are. So uh, one of the great things about Singapore is it's very merit-oriented. I think uh, that started with me winning the scholarship to come here as well. And uh, even though I was an academic uh, getting out, uh, trying to sell technology and services, uh, uh, there was receptiveness from the, from the customers. And of course, our very first customers were government. So uh, I could see that there was uh, a willingness to try, as, as my co-panelists also mentioned, uh, to try new things. And I remember in one of the first uh, few projects, we had uh, a major MMC that had just landed in Singapore that was also competing but we had to really fight on merit and we won that and from there, there was no looking back. Mm. Now, um, there are two parts about business, I would say one is the technology merit, two is the business relationship itself. So at the end of the day, it's still about people and we follow the viewpoint of people, products, profits, whether it's our customers and people, whether it's in shareholders or it's uh, our own uh, uh, talent. And from that perspective, of course, that doesn't change in the markets in the region. But of course, the situations change completely. So what is a very sanitized environment for business and acceptance in Singapore changes completely overseas. And not coming from a business background, that was a bit of a hurdle for us. Today, of course, we have offices in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in India as well. And as a part of Continental, we can approach a lot more countries. But the rule number one remains the same. You need to have local talent, you need to have local understanding, and then grow from there. Could, could we go a little bit deeper there? So what kind of skill sets are you looking for uh, from Singapore as you grow your business here? Um, so, um, uh, so first of all, uh, software engineering talent is still a backbone for us. Um, not only us, but Continental as a whole is looking at AI and robotics uh, capabilities. And not only that, we are also investing into the ecosystem to develop that talent. So Continental uh, widely supported the Singapore Institute of Technology's Bachelor's in Telematics program. And uh, these kind of programs become cross-functional very quickly. So it's not only software, but also hardware engineering and so on. Because when uh, you really hit the real world, you have to look at engineering. Uh, sometimes even civil, civil stuff comes into play as well. Mm -hmm. So. What we look for in talent is also a very cross-functional viewpoint, and now I'm speaking not only as QI or quantum inventions, but continental as a whole as well. So that's the kind of talent we look for as mm. such. Mm. Doug, do you want to comment? You have a fast expanding team, so I think you need people, right? Yeah, we're, we're always searching for more people. We're, we're desperate for great software engineers, 
Uh, but beyond that, and I think every, every panelist up here and in the previous four panelists are all searching for the same software engineers, data scientists. Uh, we're also looking for great tech managers. I think that's one of the, um, the challenges in, in Southeast Asia, for particularly for global companies, is how do we find the, the right tech managers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've imported some, but also we have a number locally that are, are local grown as well. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you, I, mentioned, uh, I remember you mentioned Scrum. What's Scrum? Yeah, um, I just pick up on your last question. I come to this one. You, you, your last question was um, uh, our experience about um, uh, kind of developing in Singapore for the Singapore market and exporting. Um, two points on that. First one is um, a positive example. Okay. Um, the um, technology bricks that were used, um, that were developed by Thales for Civil Aviation uh, Authority of Singapore (CAS) to do the air traffic management sing um, in, in Singapore, what we call Laureate Three. Um, that system, actually those bricks that we developed uh, for CAS became very, very useful for us because they were the starting point uh, for us to build what now is One Sky in Australia. You can Google it. It's uh, one of the largest, I think it's more than a billion euros um, contract controlling one of the largest swaths of air traffic in the world um, for both civil and military. So that's a very positive example where sophisticated demand in Singapore helped us build bricks that were exportable. The second uh, point that I'm trying to make, which is, I guess, the negative case study of this, is that often we realize that the sophisticated demand also has certain uh, requirements that are very unique to Singapore. Um, and if you try to sell it to other markets yeah. in the region, uh, it's over spec and, and as, a re as a result, uh, it, it's too costly. So what we try to do is, and now we encourage all our customers, of course we have a product policy that will kind of find the middle ground, and you can achieve scale and you can roll out updates um, globally. So there's certain benefit. But I think um, the other part of being very groundbreaking, the, the flip side of that same coin, is wanting to have something so unique that, that only Singapore has. So we see really the, 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 the positive and the negative mm. side of it, mm. but we think in the overall scheme of things, it works. But I guess what I'm hearing is that you use Singapore to develop, I guess, the high-end exactly. things. But, you know, to go into the region, to go into other markets, there's po probably a need to adapt that solution. That's right. For those That's markets, right. That's what we've heard in the last panel. And, and well. the right uh, price yeah. point. Yeah. So then you talked about talent, talent right? So um, talent, I think um, my co-panelists covered it quite well about the fact that, hey, we all are looking for software engineers. Software. Frankly, personally, I'm quite worried no? because we know that the government is also recruiting a lot of um, software engineers. Uh, we are trying to recruit a lot of software engineers. You hear the, the growth of the internet economy. I mean, uh, where are the warm bodies going to come from? But, um, but I, I, I have hope for the future because um, I think the kind of people we're looking for, we, maybe we're quite fussy. I mentioned about the cultural aspect of it as well. I think all of us want, well, we uh, in the digital factory at least, a very flat organization which is very different from Thales, which is more hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, and in this flat organization, we want people who are hungry, as I mentioned, hungry, humble, and aware. aware. People who are really uh, able to work in a team, uh, to have a growth mindset, to say, hey, anything is possible. Uh, every difficulty is relished uh, as a challenge uh, to jump over and to overcome. Um, and aware means aware of how um, he or she fits in into the the, the grand scheme of things. And I think that part of the, the cultural equation is not fully solved for us. Mm. Uh, but I think we will, we will solve it as, as, as we go. But uh, to conclude on talent, I think um, uh, for us, um, we also get involved uh, upstream with a lot of the, um, um, the tertiary institutions here trying to influence uh, where they're going. Um, it's finding the right balance between hardware, software, and culture. Thanks very much for that. That's a very interesting insight. It's not just the skill sets, it's also the mindset, uh, the right mindset that you're looking for. Uh, we're running a little bit out of time. I'm going to have to call time. Uh, we're going to open the floor now to questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, I think there should be a roaming mic somewhere. Uh, please, please let us know. Uh, give us your name, the organization you're working for, and then direct the questions to the panelists. Please. Getting late in the afternoon, so need to stand up first. 
But I suppose it's more, more interesting to, to us as users uh, on the ground, mobility is fun. When can we as consumer realistically expect them to be road? Is the legal system uh, ready? Are the, well, equipment, so to say, ready? So it, when will it be out on the street so that we can have fun with them? Are you Basically. talking about autonomous vehicles? Uh, yes. Okay, so that, I guess the question yeah. is most aptly. <laughs> I think I'll take that one. So uh, I, w I would say already today, we're giving over a thousand rides a week every day in, in Las Vegas. And uh, you know, strong regulatory support, uh, willingness to take risk, and, and a great market for autonomous vehicles um, allow, have allowed us to really start to commercialize there. I think. Uh, you know, saying that I like to say is that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And so I think it's going to start in places like Phoenix, Las Vegas, places that are, that are a little bit less challenging for autonomous vehicles um, and have good regulatory support. And then they'll, they'll broaden across the world. So we're, we're very actively working with the Singapore government to, to figure out when we can to really take it more broadly here in Singapore as well. Etc. as well, when you get an accident, who gets into trouble. Well, coming back to Singapore itself, is, uh, is the framework that, well, you're most familiar with, ready for it uh, itself uh, as well? Or is it just part and parcel of how the process will evolve? And I, I suppose it's realistically, when do you see it being rolled out countrywide? I mean, Singapore is good in that sense. Smart city relationship is there. So we will be ideal for that in terms of rolling out platform out here as well. So legally, um, technology-wise, everything is, when do you realistically expect these to be rolled out, say, island watch in Singapore? I mean, we see it been tested around here, obviously, but countrywide or citywide? Well, so I think part of that should go maybe more to the government. Um, we're actively participating in that at Aptiv. We are actually helping uh, draft the technical requirements documents that will form a lot of the re regulations that allow the vehicles to get out there. And so those technical regulations, the TRs, are, have just been published. Uh, we, were, we were very happy to have, uh, you know, very contribute a lot of our effort, a lot of our resources to help make sure those were, are going to allow us to commercialize. I, I broadly adopt the world into, you know, there's, there's high-risk countries like um, America, China, maybe Israel that are willing to take more risk. Uh, there's there's mid-risk countries that are they're rolling things out, and then there's low-risk countries more like Europe that are maybe uh, going to be the tail end of actually seeing this adopted, and where Singapore fits in there, that, that I think that's a, a bit of a question. But um, you know we're, we're very actively working to roll it out here and, and working with the government. We we refer to it as a collaborative model, where the industry and the government are working together to to actually get it launched. Perhaps I could add a few points to that. Uh, I, I think Doug hit the uh, nail on the head when he said collaborative approach, right? So here in Singapore, uh, safety is of utmost importance, right? As we think about introducing these new technologies and you know, actually having them uh, ply the roads in a mixed traffic environment. Uh, and, and we're not like, uh, I think, some suburbia in the United States where, you know, you, Traffic is very light. You know, I just visited Arizona. I just visited Las Vegas. Um, Vegas may be a little bit heavier. Uh, so, so we have to take a pretty cautious approach. Uh, I think what the government is doing is really working on a framework. So you heard about the technical reference. It's just been published. Uh, we're working on developing milestone tests to make sure that uh, the vehicles uh, can be tested and we, ha we have a certain level of assurance before we let them onto the road. Uh, what we're working towards then is now a pilot service uh, by 2022 or 2023 in some of our new towns, uh, Pongo, Jurong Innovation District, as well as Tenga. So, so I think if you need a timeline, 2022-2023 is uh, what LTA is planning towards. Any other questions? I just have one fun one, which is... Uh, you know, you spoke a little bit about passenger drones, about drones, and I suppose some people have talked about the Jetsons. Uh, when do you think that will happen? Um, lesson number one, never give a date. <laughs> um, if you look at it uh, today, in terms of um, control technology, right? Um, uh, Thales already has very sophisticated systems um, that are on, let's say, um, military 
um, drones. Um, so there's a certain maturity level to, to the technology. Um, I think the big question when you talk about flying taxis is a much more, uh, let's say, complex problem in my view compared to, uh, let's say, autonomous cars. Uh, the reason for that is space is 3D and you have a lot of, um, you have, you have um, buildings just like in, in uh, autonomous cars um, and you also have uh, the whole passenger experience which has to be mastered. So it does not suffice to have a flying uh, vehicle bring you from point A to point B. You need to have a pleasant experience which is absolutely safe. Um, so our, um, our team is working quite um, aggressively to, um, uh, with, with the, uh, our key partners to figure out what's the, the, the fastest route to, to market because it is a complex uh, problem. Just just give you an example. Talking about unmanned um, uh, air traffic, uh, the numbers are just crazy. So your, today there's, there's no system that can really deal with the kind of numbers that are expected if air taxis are, are available. In, and to have a man in the loop um, actually takes efficiency out of the system. So we're working also on the whole unmanned traffic uh, management space, uh, including the sensors and, uh, and the C2 systems required to, to run that. So there's a whole infrastructure and system that needs to back up before we'll see. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's so not for 2022, 2023. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, any response? We look a lot at, at safety as well. And, and the man in the loop is a very interesting point for air traffic. Because you know, in our own safety systems, we see that uh, you know, an active braking system can res respond about 40,000 times faster than a human in terms of seeing danger and actually starting to brake. And then our cars using radars and, and lidars can actually see much more than what humans can see and start to respond even earlier. So I think as we learn to trust the automated systems more and they get more, more intelligent, it's really going to just orders of magnitude more safe for us to travel. And hopefully in the air as well. And I'd like to fly by the Marina Bay Sands too as, as, <laughs> as you're building the system out. The hard part for all of us is um, as artificial intelligence gets more prevalent, um, how do you, because in, let's say, in the aviation space, right, you will demonstrate a certain uh, safety level, um, and likewise for the automotive space. But how do you then apply this to a non-deterministic type of process, right? Because artificial intelligence has that, that kind of, as uh, an element of, element of non-determinism, right? So you can't say, okay, if this happens, this happens, this happens, this is your safe outcome because there's a data fusion and there's a bit of fuzziness in the, in the logic. So that is the challenge for, I think, all of us, and, and uh, the industry is still working on it. Thanks very much for that. Well, I think we're really out of time now. Uh, and I just want to conclude by saying, you know, I think the future of mobility is very exciting, in my opinion. Uh, it's going to transform the way in which we travel around and we move goods around. And I'm just really happy that you know, we have these companies here in Singapore working on the technology and creating jobs for Singaporean. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks.